I say thanks for the things you've done for me. Things so undeserved, yes, you gave to prove your love for me. And the voices of a million angels could not express my gratitude. All that I am and ever hope to be, I owe it all to thee. To God be the glory, to God.
Stop! 
changing, but you remain the same. And I thought to myself, Lord, I'm so glad that you are an unchangeable God. Because when we look around us with everything that is happening now, it will just about sometimes, if you're not grounded, it will blow your mind away. So much violence and chaos that's happening. But thank God that he is an unchangeable God. And you can depend on him in the midst of whatever the storm might be. I want to thank Brother Philip Bullock. Bullock, that's right. What was it Bullock? Bullock. For that, uh, for that solo. I mean, God has really gifted him with a beautiful voice. God bless. And we pray that, that the Lord will continue to use you and carry you to higher heights. Thank you so very much. Choir, thank you also. Uh, I think Brother, uh, Brother Philip, he lifted us from the mundane to the next level, to the divine. And you hear me say this so often, many times, and it doesn't matter who you are, what position you hold in the church, sometimes you can come to the worship service and your physical body will be there but your mind will be elsewhere. And sometimes God has to trap our attention in order and then bring us together and unify our thinking and our spirits and put us, point, pointing us toward one direction. For those of you who have not been here with us, we have been exploring Psalm 103, the 103rd Psalm, Psalm 103. We've been taking it in segments. Um, I could have easily just glossed over the whole psalm at one time, but I felt as though that that was not with the leading of the Holy Spirit, that God had something to say for all of us, especially myself included in this psalm. And if you don't remember, after we've concluded with the last segment next Sunday, if it's God's will, if you don't remember anything else about Psalm 103, whatever it is read to you, whatever you read it in your meditation in the future, remember this one overarching thought that feels and that saturates this psalm, and it's one word, and it's easy to remember. We always talk about God's grace and mercy. We sing about it. This psalm talks about the mercy of God. Repeat that with me. The mercy of God. Say it again. The mercy of God. Now, that's easy to remember. It from, from verse 1, concluding at verse 22, everything in this psalm is pointing, is elevating, it is extolling, and it is elevating the God of mercy. Just for bringing us uh, and I use this term like the young people say, to bring us up to snuff this morning. The first five verses beginning this psalm, David starts out by using the terminology, bless the Lord, O my soul, and all that is in me. Bless his holy name. And we said that the word bless there in Hebrew means to praise God. So in actuality, what David is saying, praise the Lord, O my soul, and all that is within me, praise his holy name. Now, when you think about it, why would David 
uh, apparently in, the, in what he said in his statement here, beginning this song, why would he say, praise the Lord, oh my soul, and everything that's in me? And he wasn't talking about the physical anatomy of his body, but he was talking about his mind, his heart, his soul, his emotions, everything. And uh, it appears that something had happened because you remember David in his life, God had blessed David tremendously. He had watched over him, protected him. His mercy had enveloped him when he was running from Saul and Jonathan, who was Saul's son. They protected him. He was running from cave to cave. God gave him, you remember, the beginning of his life, gave him the victory over the giant. He came out of a praying home, we can say. Uh, God elevated him to kingship. And before David, before God put him in that position, the kingdoms were scattered. The, tr the 12 tribes, each of them had their own individual uh, uh, type of government. But David solidified the 12 tribes, brought them together under his reign and under his leadership. God blessed David in so many ways, but like with human flesh, <clears throat> excuse me, we won't get, get to that in a moment, all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. Amen? And not only David, but let's bring it up to the present moment. All of us have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. It's so easy to project your thinking uh, to another person and to think in terms of what you hear about them, oh, that's so tragic. I wouldn't have done that. They, they, they're so pathetic. But you got to remember there was something that God knows. Maybe nobody else knows about it. But God knows something that I did in the past, a bad decision, a stupid action that I took that God, in his mercy, he gave me another chance. And we know that mercy is what? Keeping from me what I deserve. Grace is giving me what I have not earned. So in this psalm, he begins by saying, praise the Lord, bless the Lord, O my soul, everything that is, that is within me. Then he goes on to identify those things that God has done. And he puts it in large categories. And it's about five benefits that he gives. He talks about in terms of saving him, uh, rescuing him, uh, taking care of him, feeding him, and goes on and on and on. And naturally, in order for him to list these benefits, these benefits were not just present blessings of God, but they were past what God had already done. Again, each of us this morning can easily identify with God's past blessings. And you don't have to think back you no know, 10 and 15 years however old you are. Just think back to yesterday. Well, can, can I say this in a country way? Think back to yesterday. And yesterday will testify to the fact that God's mercy has given me another chance. In fact, he woke us up this morning, did he not? He gave us another brand new day. The slate is clean. Now it's up to us not to mess it up. Just like when the teacher, when you were in the classroom when you were younger, called you up to the front of the class for you to write your ABCs on the, on the, on the board, chalkboard, and you messed up. And the teacher erased it, gave you another chance to put it down. God has given us what? Another chance for a brand new day. Then in verses 6 to 10, he talks about the overflowing mercies of God. And he uses an example. He says that God revealed himself to Moses. In other words, he revealed his character, who he was to Moses, and to the people of Israel, he revealed his power. He revealed his, how he used his power 
in order to what? To keep his people together and to fight the enemies for them. What? By dividing the Red Sea, giving them water out of a rock, bringing down quail. He demonstrated his authority, his power to them. But Moses knew him. The people knew God by what he did for them. We who are post now, we know God both ways. We know him and we know him by what he has done for us. Amen? So thank God that not only do we know him in the form of Jesus Christ, not only do we know his power demonstrated through his Holy Spirit, but we know in terms of what he has done for us. And, the, and, 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 and I'm not, I, I don't want you to think I'm talking in generalities. I'm talking about in specifics now. I'm talking about maybe some diehard situation, some up against the wall situation where there was no, there was no out of it. There was no exit out of it. But God, what? Stepped in, intervened, and made a way. Have any of you ever had that to happen? If you haven't, then let me tell you, when God does it in your life, not only are you thankful at that moment, but you realize for the rest of your life to whom you owe your allegiance to, it is the God of mercy. Then in verses 11 to 14, he talks about the boundaries of God's mercy. How far do his mercies go? How long do they last? And he uses the example, he said, as high as the heavens above the earth. That's how, what? That's how far his mercy extends, which means his mercy starts at the seat of the throne of grace, then comes down. Then he gives us horizontal directions. He said, as far as the east is from the west, has he removed what? Our transgression. He is saying that when God forgives you, it's not coming back again to haunt you. Once he removes your sin, you never meet your sin when you walk around the corner. It's gone. It's been put in the sea of forgetfulness not to come back to haunt you in this life anymore. Let me say it my way. When God forgives, he forgives. I want God's forgiveness. I don't want man's forgiveness. No, no. Can't depend on it. He's too erratic. He's too vacillating. He's too unpredictable. Can't depend on him. And the reason why I know I can't depend on him, because sometimes I can't even depend on myself. But I can depend on God. Then in verses 15 to 18, he talks about his mercy never runs out. It never runs out. And he uses, well, you can parallel that with what Paul says in Romans, the fifth chapter, the end of the fifth chapter where Paul says that even though sin abounds, grace abounds much more. What is Paul saying? You can't out sin God's grace. Amen. There is no such thing as that. I have been so bad in my life. I've done so many heinous things in my life. I know God can't forgive me because I can't forgive myself. No, no. No way. God can forgive the blackest sin. And the reason why we know that he can is because look at Jesus Christ, the agony and the pain he went through on that cross. Look what he had to suffer. You know why he suffered that? Because of the blackness, the evilness of sin. Let me bring it home to all of us. We here in St. Louis have been looking at the face of sin for several months. Amen? Violence. And some of the things that were done, it was not done with a gracious heart or loving heart. It was done with meanness, with malice, without forethought. People were hurt. People were killed. In fact, I was, and I, I don't know why I, 
I am keeping count of this, and this is not, it's a negative count, but it's not something to be proud of. But I was keeping count of last night. They were talking about up to this point here in St. Louis, how many homicides we've had. It's almost 150 people this year that have been killed. And look like every weekend there is some mad fool out there decides I'm going to add to the number. Saturday night, early Sunday morning, somebody leaves this world. We want to look at verses 15 to 18 for a few moments as David continues to think about our human weakness. Now, there are a lot of philosophies, there are a lot of um, theoretical thinkers that are throwing out what the Bible would term as demonic slop, that man is the maker of himself. He's the master of his own fate, humanism, hedonism, and some of the other isms that are out there. You look at Islam, where it talks about that there is no other God but their God, and that their God demands that if you don't bow to him, you are exterminated. Crazy world that we live in, isn't it? The ethical standards that used to exist when I was young coming up, there are no ethical standards anymore in our society now. No level of morality. Anything goes. You think of it, you, 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 vi you visualize it, you want to do it, go ahead and do it. In fact, the more goalish it is, it looks like the more that the public enjoys it. Let me also add this. We have been saturated in our culture today so much with violence over the tube until to a degree we have become anesthetized to violence and evil. We have become numb. We see it. We don't see it. It's there, but we try to take our minds away from it and go into something else, not to think about it, until another blast of evil comes along to bring us back down to earth again. And it looks like the author behind the evil tries to devise every time a more heinous attack, a greater blow to mankind. But I want you to remember this, in spite of the black clouds that seem to be looming overhead now, there is a God. Repeat that after me. There is a God. Don't you ever forget that? Don't you ever let anybody try to dissuade you or even to doubt whether God cares. Oh, yes, he cares. And we, we, we're going to see what David says about it in this psalm. Now, admittedly, man has made a lot of strides in the area of medicine and science. In fact, in the last 30 to 40 years, medicine has come further than it has for the last three or four hundred years. Yes, we admit man has made strides, but to a degree, even though he's made strides technologically and advancements in all of these other areas, and uh, there was a time when spacecraft, when they would shoot up in the atmosphere, it was exciting, it was mind-blowing, but now when we hear about a spacecraft going up, well, I'll be in attention. In other words, well, it's just another spacecraft. No big deal about it, so we move on about our business. Amen? 
But no matter how, how smart man is or might become, he can never replace nor supplant God who made this universe. Do you understand what I'm saying? He can never, never, never supplant God. David says that we are like a flower in the field. Wind blows over the flower. The flower fades. It's gone. And that's bad enough. But then David said not only does a flower wither and die, but the place where the flower was planted can't even remember that the flower was there in the root edge. That's awesome. That's awesome. Turn to Isaiah chapter 40, verse 6 and 7. Isaiah, the 40th chapter, the 6th and the 7th verse. Isaiah alludes to this same theme where he says, the flower fades, the grass withers, the breath of God blows over the grass and the flower, and it dies to come back no more. Amen? But then, as it says, but the word of God stands forever. When you look at and go back in history, all of the civilizations that during their heyday they were great and powerful and awesome from the Egyptian Empire to the Babylonian Empire to the Persian Empire to the Roman Empire, you name it. These were great military mights, but where are they now? The only thing that exists of them and lets us know that they what once were here thousands of years ago is what? Monuments and bones that are left. For the sands of time have covered those civilizations over. And also, this might be shocking to you because there was a time in our history that people were saying that America will be here forever. Don't you believe that? Why are you looking at me so strange? Do you think that we are better than other civilizations? Do you know that the decadence here in America, I'm talking about the evil, the things that people do, uh, the, from the pedophiles, serial killers, do you know that this was done before people in this generation thought about it? Rome had all of this perversion. That's the reason why she fell from on the inside like a worm eating at the core of an apple. Beautiful on the outside, but rotten on the inside. America, for now, God is permitting her to bloom and to look good on the outside, but the day is going to come. God is going to get tired of this mess here. Boy, sure they get silent then. Well, let me give you this assurance. Don't worry about it, because we ain't going to be here anyway. A hundred years from now, we won't be nothing but dust. And even the memory of our having been here, those who knew us, if they are gone, then nobody will remember us. Do you understand what David is saying? <sighs> the reason why our loved ones who are gone are remembered is because we who are here, we what? We keep before us and others, we keep their memory alive by talking about them, pictures showing them, amen? But what happens when we die? Who will know about your loved one then? Nobody. I know you don't want to think about it. That's shocking, but that's reality. And that's what David is trying to get us to understand. We are weak. We are here for a season. We are forgotten. 
we are gone. But then he says there's another option. Even though time and man forgets us, God always remembers us. Ain't that good news? Well, if it's good news, it look like you ought to be celebrating good news. You ought to say something. When the choir sang and you stand up and clap your hands, you ought to stand up and clap your hands on this. Ain't that good news? Well, stand up and clap your hands and say, that's good news. Amen. Good news. That God remembers us in our weakness. He talks about his covenant of mercy, which is nothing but his love covenant of grace. And he said it's for those that fear him. I'm not afraid of God. I'm scared of lightning. <laughs> but I'm not scared of God. Lightning will kill me if I get in the way of it. God won't kill me. Now God can kill me. But he won't. Why is it that God won't do what I deserve? It's because he what? He loves me. And not only do I fear him, but God's righteousness is extended not only to my children, your children, but it's extended to our grandchildren, to our great-grandchildren, to our great-great-grandchildren from generation to generation. In other words, my mother and father, they are gone, but God's mercy still is extended to me. And then after I'm gone, it will be extended to my children. After they are gone, it will be extended to their children. God is an awesome God. Now, if I was God and if you were God, you wouldn't do that. You would base your mercy. Your mercy would be calculated by how you perceived people. If they deserved your mercy. And if you felt as though they didn't deserve it, you wouldn't waste your mercy on them. Got an amen from over there. Oh, okay, okay. We do it all the time. Let me give an example, and I'm just about through. We're getting close to the Christmas, to the celebration of the birth of our Lord and Savior. Amen? amen. And there will be, as the tradition and the custom is, an exchanging of gifts. I give you a gift. You give me a gift. Amen? Now, I, 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 I don't want you to um, elevate your hand or to signify that you've been thinking about this. Just keep it to yourself because you, you know God knows what you've been thinking. But how many here this morning, you, you, you got a tinge of somebody that crossed your path this year that let that left a little taste of bitterness in your mouth, and you've been contemplating maybe not giving them a gift because of what they said or did. Don't, don't show no hands. I, want you, I, I, I don't want you to reveal your weakness, but you've been praying over it, and you've been asking God to clean out your heart, to get your mind right. Now, based on that small illustration, what if God did the same thing when we disappoint him or let him down or walk away from him? What if he decided that he was not going to give us for Christmas, his gift of grace and mercy embodied in Jesus Christ. I got to think about it. Uh, as of now, I'm not, I'm a little bit reluctant about loving them, but hopefully maybe I have a change of heart later on. How do you think God loves this mess down here? You have to have an agape heart to love 
people that are unlovable, that don't want to be loved, that are mean, do things just to hurt other folk. You got to have God's love in your heart. In 1 John chapter 4, verse 10, John says that at the beginning, and, and, and this is my paraphrasing, you and I did not know how to love, but God, who is love, who is the epitome of love, showed you and me how to love, put his love in our hearts by sending his son as a perpetuation for our sins. Because he first, what, loved you and me, it has shown us how to love one another. How do you think that we tolerate one another? And put up with one another because of the love of God. Why? Because we know that God's love is put up with us. And his love in our hearts has given us another chance. So therefore, his love demands that we love one another. He doesn't ask us it would be a nice thing to do. It would be a polite thing to do. It sure would help in terms of the relationships and the fellowships in our society. He says, I command you to love one another. Now, the reason why he commands that, and he just doesn't say that as print on paper, but he says that because I can empower you to do what you don't want to do, that you're not inclined to do, that you don't feel gracious to do. I can give you a heart of love to love those folk that you don't want to love, that you don't want to give a gift to for Christmas. And I'm not necessarily talking about a physical gift. It could be a gift of a word of encouragement a word of pray, praying for that individual. See, gifts come tangibly and intangibly. Amen? His mercy and his righteousness are for those who what? First of all, keep his laws. Secondly, to those who remember his commandments. Thirdly, to those who do his will. Finally, David says, God, in his mercy, remembers. What does he remember? He remembers those who remember him. There's a song that says, O oh Lord, remember me. And we sing that. I can't remember the rest of the lyrics. But it's something like, when I'm in dire need, O oh Lord, remember me. When I'm sick, on oh, my bed, oh Lord, remember me. Why do I want God to remember me? Why? Some folks say, I got my loved ones to remember me. I got my family, my children. They are there. Why do we want God to remember me? Well, for those of us who have gone through certain trials and tribulations, we know that family and friends, that's fine. But we know that they are temporary like we're temporary. They're not going to be here. And when you start to losing family members, then you realize even though you cherish the family, the family is not an eternal thing. It is a temporary thing. The only person you got in your life that's concrete that you can depend on from birth to death is our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Oh, Lord, remember me. When I'm dying, remember me. When I'm sick, my health breaks, remember me. When nothing in the family goes right, when there seems to be chaos and confusion, when the children ain't doing right, when the grandchildren are going crazy, oh Lord, what? Remember me. I believe in him. I obey him. Even though we live in time, but our grounding, our foundation is in eternity. I, don't, I, can't, I can't speak for you, but whenever I watch the tube, it doesn't matter, and you know, most of y'all know that I am a, 
I am a Western lover. I love Westerns. I love cowboys. The older they are, the more I enjoy them. They don't have the color in them, but the stories that they tell, most of them are based on ethics and morals. The good man and the wrong man. And even though the bad man does bad, but the end of the story, the good guy wins. You see the ethical standard weaving through those stories, the morality weaving through those stories, they just put it in the setting of the cowboy. And the bad guy gets exterminated. And whenever I see the bad guy getting exterminated, you know what I say, good, good, he should have been a long time ago. I'm glad. He's low down, rotten. And then the Holy Spirit said, wait a minute. There's an identification here. You could be the bad guy. And if you could be the bad guy, would you want to be exterminated, eradicated, and blown apart? Well, Lord, you're right. No, uh, I guess, I guess, you know, if you give me another chance, because God in his mercy gives me not only one more chance, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve, twelve. My arm is getting tired. He keeps on giving me chance after chance. And let me say to those who are of the mindset, well, I know I ain't perfect, but I ain't as bad as some other folk I've heard about. I haven't done this, done that. Okay, maybe not. Maybe you have not done a heinous crime, but God said all is sin. Even if you didn't overtly do it, you thought about it. We, the, more, the longer God permits me to live and the more I observe humanity, nobody but God could love us. Nobody but God. Thank God for his mercy. I, I'm glad. I'm glad. And I'm always thinking, Lord, as the song says, it's not my mother, not my brother, not my sister, but who is me, O oh Lord, that stands in the need of prayer? God in his tender mercy, Jesus dying on that cross and saying, Father, forgive them. And all of us this morning are included in the them category. He wasn't just talking about those people immediately that were there, but he was talking about us that would come later. Forgive them. Forgive Barter. Forgive Pleasant Green. Forgive my children, my grandchildren. Forgive us. For we really don't know how stupid and ignorant we are. As we get ready to extend an invitation for discipleship, a sinner doesn't think. No, let me let me let me, let me go back. Sinners don't think they are sinners. Sinners think that everybody else is a sinner but them. Now, 
God says the only way that you can be righteous, you have to be in Christ. Is that right? On your own, you're not righteous. By yourself, you're not righteous. But in Christ, you inherit his righteousness. It doesn't matter where you live, what type of job you have, what your aspirations are. It doesn't mean anything to God because all flesh is grass. And one day, we won't be here. But while we're here on planet Earth, as David said in the 90th Psalm, Lord, teach me, teach Barna, teach Flint, teach Stokes, teach Wicker, teach me to number my days. Not going to the calendar and looking at where my birthday is. Not how many more days till this major event or this celebration. But teach me to live what days you have given me in my life to their fullest. By glorifying Jesus Christ and pointing somebody to Calvary so that my heart will be applied to what? Wisdom. Not my wisdom, but God's wisdom. God's wisdom is different from mine. What I think is wise, God says is foolishness. And what's foolishness to me, God says that's wise. I don't know what category you fall in this morning. I don't know whether you're unsaved or even unchurched. Because as I say so many times before, coming to church and mingling with the sheep doesn't make you a sheep. Saying ba-ba doesn't change your nature. Being among the flock doesn't miraculously change your soul and your heart. Jesus Christ is the only one that can do that. He's the only one that can make you brand new. Lord, create in me what? A clean heart. Renew the right spirit in me. And above all, restore unto me what? The joy of your salvation. You need Jesus. Need Jesus on this journey. We need him to walk with us. Because we really can't make it from day to day. We don't know what perils are waiting for you and me even later on this evening when we go back to our domiciles. The enemy of our souls is waiting to destroy us. Don't you ever think that Satan loves you Satan can use you to accomplish his ends to destroy you, but he doesn't love you. So don't take his gifts. Don't take his presence. Because all of his presence have a string attached to them. Jesus Christ gives you a gift. No strings attached. Come as you are. Isaiah tells us that he says, if you are thirsty, come and drink. If you're hungry, come and eat. Got no money, that's no problem. Come and buy. I will furnish everything that's necessary for your soul. If you're here this morning, as the choir leads us in the song of discipleship, will you come? Will you let Jesus Christ be your hero, be your light, in this dark world.